Ich weiß nicht, was soll es bedeuten, was ich so traurig
This aria has no accompaniment. The composer thought it would provide a pleasant relief after all that piano music. And as for me, I like the idea very much, since it leaves me free to sing however I like. If I feel like singing very Oh, very quickly, I, there's nothing to stop me. I can hold no I can leave pauses, I can make cuts, I can even add a line or two of my own <clears throat> to be or not to be, and no one will ever know except the director and the composer and the other singers. But generally speaking, the freedom is wonderful. However, there is one small problem. The aria is supposed to end on an A. And if I go off key, there is no way of concealing it because the piano comes in on that Perhaps you think that is elementary, but the truth of the matter is that it is very difficult, even for the finest singer, to sing for such a long time without going a little bit soft or falling a little bit flat. As I come to the end of this aria, I always begin to worry whether I might have gone off pitch. After all, even though I am only the contralto, I do have a reputation to maintain. But now, the moment has come, and I must finish the... That didn't feel quite right. I think it should be a little higher. I think I'll leave it there. And I must finish the aria.
Not a note, I promise. <laughs> um, John, what an extraordinary way to start the evening. Simon and Emma were just unbelievable. It really is wonderful. We know Simon very well, of course, because yes. he's been performing here uh, for many years. He's a professor now at the, at the Royal College and the, one of the official pianists uh, for the Cardiff, BBC Cardiff Singer of the World. Uh, but Emma is relatively unknown. I first heard her two years ago in an audition here uh, for the Wigmore Guildhall Prize. And um, everybody tells me I was on cl cloud nine afterwards. And uh, she's, she really is very special. And we're only at the beginning. She goes to Berlin next year. She's beginning to learn the craft of a recyclist. But it's wonderful to be able to give somebody a public platform with that sort of potential at an occasion like this. So well done, Emma and Simon. Super. What a voice and what wit, and also, in some respects, what a slightly unexpected programme, which is what the Wigmore Hall gives to many of us, week after week after week. We come for what we think we know, and we discover things that we fall in love with immediately. So thank you for that. Um, I suppose it's an invidious question, John, but given your own background, I imagine that song and leader is your prime love still. Uh, not anymore, no. Oh. Uh, I think I, I love it all equally. Uh, early music and Baroque, the, the piano series here now is, is one of the strongest in Europe. We've got about 70 concerts next season. We've got 80 lead recitals wow. and chamber music, string quartets in particular. I absolutely love uh, string quartets and... Um, Everything except song. <laughs> Sorry? Everything except uh, every, song. Well, no, I, I, I still love song. And, and I'm very happy to chair the Cardiff Singer of the World uh, song jury. That's great. So we're going to talk about two things this evening, briskly. We're going to talk about the programme ahead and all the luscious treats that are in store. And we're going to talk about money. And you can't separate the two things because without the money, this place would be silent and empty. Let me begin with that, therefore. You raise two and a half million a year um, just to keep the thing going, and you also want to raise another 25 million, I think, uh, between now and 2028, which is a lot of money. And I think if I tot it up, it, it adds up to about 45 million in total. What on earth do you want it all for? Well, uh, just, just to put it in context, 15 years ago, uh, this was very much a hole for hire. And about 195 of the concerts were at our own risk and everything else was hired out. In the year ahead, 450 of the concerts uh, will be taken at Wigmore Hall's risk and that's, that's a substantial investment. And we've gone from being at 2.7 million enterprise seven years or 15 years ago to a 7.5 million enterprise. And there's no getting away from it. It costs between 15 and 30,000 pounds to put a concert on here. Obviously, it costs more the more people you have on stage or if you've got a very established star. Uh, and we, through our fundraising efforts, through that raising that 2.5 million pounds a year from, from all of you and from people watching online, uh, we subsidize every seat to the tune of about 19 pounds. The Arts Council subsidizes the other one pound. So every seat is subsidized by 20 pounds. And I don't think we would have the attendances that we're having. And also, we have this wonderful scheme now for the under 35-year-olds, uh, where we've got 20,000 seats available right across the season in each of the series at five pounds for anybody under the age of 35. And then in conjunction with the wonderful Cavatina Chamber Music Trust, free seats for hundreds of youngsters under the age of 25. And when they're in, it completely changes the feel and the atmosphere. And we're introducing these this wonderful chamber music and these wonderful songs, these great treasures of human creativity and imagination to an audience. And of course, anybody anywhere from any background can watch us many times a month now online and catch up through our own auspices. And that's wonderful al alongside what we do with Radio 3. And John, do you feel that sort of visibly you are getting a more diverse and a slightly younger audience? Because I used to come here for many reasons, but one of them was it was about the only place in London where I still felt young. <laughs> I think that's, that's a bit of a myth, and as I look out, I see plenty of young faces. Uh, I think we've got to be very careful. Of course, we are encouraging a young audience, but some of the language that's used around older audiences, I find uh, it, it's, not to, it's not in good taste, because I have a photograph of looking out at an audience like this from 1950, and it very much looked like you. They were dressed better, 
but uh, they, they, and the hats were better, but they looked like you. And uh, I really find it offensive when people, the naysayers, say that we're dying because somebody who's 50 years of age suddenly discovers music. Well, the chances are they'll still be coming here when they're 90. And is somebody over 50 or somebody who's 60, just because they're not in their 20s or their 30s, they're not an inferior listener by any means. So let's get away from that sort of language. Sure. It's, it's, it's really unhelpful, I think, and, and counterproductive. And I've wanted to say that for a long time, actually. So you, the, yeah. we're able to mix the youth with the established audience, and they're, they're not beating each other up. We're all getting on just fine. But there seems to be a very, there's a very important aspect of that, John, because this is a very, very special hall in many people's hearts. And that's partly because of the space and the acoustics, but it's also very substantially about the audience. This seems to be a particularly knowledgeable audience. So when performers come onto this stage, they know they are up against people who really understand their music and are listening for every note. Yes, this is where you come in London, certainly, to earn your, your recital and your chamber music credentials. And you come back throughout a career to reinforce those credentials. And as the programmer, I can set out my stall and uh, put all sorts of artists and ideas and themes in front of you. Uh, three times a year, we go on sale in chunks of 150 concerts. And every I feel like it's an election every time. And I say, well, have the votes come in? Am I still, do I still have my seat? Because the audience votes with their feet. And it's my job uh, as the artistic director to, to bring as diverse and innovative a program as, as I possibly can in front of the audience, but the public, and public, the public is very different, because sometimes something will sell out in Vienna or Paris, and you bring that person to London, and you've got 80 people in the hall. But if you work on it, and if you introduce them and reintroduce them in a particular way, the audience usually follows. You, you, you build up. Now, just before we get on to the programming, which is endlessly interesting, let me just ask you again about the money, because there seems to be a capital element of what you want to do as well. Absolutely. So we are fundraising towards an endowment, and this, this as you know, was Beckstein Hall in 1901 and, and, and became Wigmore Hall. One of, the, one of the few really unequivocally good things to come out of the Great War. <laughs> Perhaps. As well, I we, understand it. We, we, we now have a Bechstein Society named, named in honor of that period in the Hall's history. And that's mainly made up of people who are pledging uh, towards, uh, towards legacies. And uh, at the moment, we have informal pledges of about 14 million from that group of people. And that continues to grow every week. There's another pledge. Uh, so getting to 25 million, getting to 45 million by 2028, it's ambitious, but I think it's, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we need the 25 million to uh, possibly expand. This is a wonderful hall. It's one of the best acoustics in the world. But it's the only international concert hall that I know that survives at one function room, which doubles as the learning space downstairs, the Beckstein room, which is a basement with no windows. And we've got a restaurant, and we've got a cramped foyer, and limited facilities. Uh, very limited backstage facilities for the artists. They, they put up with a great deal. We were able to refurbish them last year, but we could offer them much more. So I'm not saying any more uh, if adjacent property becomes available. I'm saying when adjacent property becomes available, we need to be able to pounce. And uh, so we need, the money, we need the money in the bank. And also, if you think of that 7.5 million turnover, a 2 or 3% inflationary rise every year is a couple of hundred thousand pounds. The Arts Council gives us £300,000 at the moment. That's ever decreasing. It's diminished from the moment I arrived here. Um, and uh, it, it might eventually not, not be there at all. So we've got to prepare for every, eventual, every eventuality. And uh, we're not going to rest on our laurels. It would be very remiss of the Board of Trustees or anybody here not to look that far ahead into the future. So there you heard it, heard it here first, pouncing money. I've never heard of pouncing money before. <laughs> Um, John, you took over as artistic director here at about the same time that I started the Andrew Marr show. It's a very, very long time ago now. Can you just reflect a little bit on the difference between the programming and the atmosphere here then and now? Well, I, I was able to build on a wonderful tradition of my very esteemed predecessor, William Lyne, who was here for 37 years. And uh, today is actually Rubenstein's birthday. Wow. And Rubenstein is somebody who helped William Lyne very much because in 1976, on the 75th anniversary of the Hall, um, William, very much against the wishes of the Arts Council at the time, who were the ultimately in charge, was, was told not to book celebrities and not to do special series. He asked Rubenstein to give that anniversary concert. 
Rubenstein stood up at the end of the concert and said, uh, this is my very last public appearance. This is a wonderful hall. All the great artists of the world, please come back. And that's what gave William the ability then to start bringing artists back. So I was able to build on that legacy and then expand the number. So when William left, we had about 195 or so own promotions. We now have the best part of 450. And to double the number of string quartet concerts, to have between 80 and 90 song recitals, to have this absolutely flourishing mm. early, early music and baroque series, and to have the best ensembles coming from, from Europe and from all over the world to take part in that series, to commission anything up to 20 new works a year, because this hall has a wonderful history of composer performers. So all of that is there, and the public is coming in good numbers to, to, to the various strands. And of course, we put £400,000 into the learning programme, into the outreach programme, uh, which is very much about making this whole for everybody and breaking down any notion of elitism or any perceived barriers to entry. Uh, you don't have to read music to enjoy music. Uh, mm. We don't want people to think that, that, that there's a barrier to coming across the threshold. That's why we're beaming what we can digitally across the world. And that's why we're reaching out to so many communities through music. We have toddlers here, we have under ones. Uh, several times a month and we work with people living with dementia and their carers because their carers are sometimes just as isolated. We're very mm. conscious that we're hyper connected and actually the, uh, the learning theme next season is all about connectivity but we're very conscious of those living in isolation and how we can help them through music. And I think you're reaching out as well to offenders and prisoners as well now, there's, or you're thinking there, about we're, it. We're, there's talk of that and we're talking to a very deprived London borough about that using Carnegie Hall and our friends our colleagues at Carnegie Hall who've been her very helpful uh, in informing us how to do this. Uh, getting to youngsters just before or around the time when they commit a first offence and using music, whatever they perceive chamber music to be, it doesn't have to be in the traditional sense, uh, to get them off the streets and to give them something to do and to, to give them a sense of identity. And this particular borough has a wonderful sense of identity and a wonderful uh, arts programme already, so it's, we're knocking on an open door there. So you will hear more about that in the years ahead. Let's talk a little bit about the wonderful programme coming up and all the treats that are in store. You mentioned um, Re uh, uh, artists in residence. You've got a composer in residence, Thomas Larcher, who's an Austrian. Um, he's very well known for chamber scale pieces. Is that why he was chosen? Yeah, and also he had a wonderful success with an opera last year, and he writes wonderfully for the, for the human voice. Uh, he's also a great pianist, so we've, we've commissioned him, first of all, in a song recital for Andre Schuhn, a wonderful young baritone who the audience is getting to know here, and he will play alongside Paul Lewis because they're very good friends. So there's a whole celebration of his music right across the season. And all sorts of other people to mention, but Florian Busch, for instance, is another Austrian yes, who's going to be here. and uh, he's yet to sing Winterreiser here, so we're going to put that right. Oh, fantastic. And some Krennic, which is rarely performed, so we have him uh, in residence. Andras Schiff is here in Schumann, Janacek, Beethoven and Bach, and that's wonderful because Andras so much personifies the spirit of this place, and he is, he is our greatest statesman. Uh, in terms of Wigmore Hall. Indeed, and I have to say, I had the privilege of being back in the green room behind before this started, and you see the photographs, the signed photographs of all the greatest musicians of the last 50 or 60 years there. It must be the most intimidating green room for young performers anywhere in the <laughs> world. But there is Andras Schiff looking like a small boy um, signing it, so he's been coming for a very, very long time. But you've got some fantastic people coming in. The Takash, again, one of my great favourites are coming back. They're here, and the, the Doric Quartet Dorian. will be here in Absolutely. late Schubert, the Aben Quartet in late Beethoven. Um, I've asked the Pavel Haas Quartet to take on the seven Martinu Quartets. They've never been heard together in London, and they've never been played together in this hall. Initially, they said no, uh, <laughs> but they've now said yes, and they've surrounded with other Czech repertoire, and I think that will be a, a, a very good series. I think that will be a sellout series. Gary Hoffman, the cellist, is also here. I think he's somebody who's been neglected in London and we should hear more of him and he's here in Fore and Debussy and Sanson and, and more Poulenc. So we're looking forward to that very much indeed. And there's something that really intrigues me here because my favourite novelist is Proust and there is a special Proust event. So I assume that you have finally dug up the Vonté um, quartet and we're going to hear the little phrase as it's never been heard before. Absolutely. And we're, sort of. we're, we're, we're going to look... in. In many ways, through his writing, Proust shows us uh, the way souls communicate 
through music. And that's the soul of music up there, by the way, so I think it's appropriate to say this. And it just struck me backstage as we were waiting that uh, Sansons and Han, who, and Han was very close to Proust, mm. as we know, and so many of these composers who formed part of Proust's life, you know, they made an indelible mark on him, Absolutely. and he made an indelible mark on literature, they were on this stage. So, and his centenary, of course, is 2022. And um, I've asked Stephen Isselis to preside over this festival. It will be, take place over six days. We've had lots of rows about it, actually. Um, and we've been able to bring in some young performers, the, the violist Timothy Ridout, who I think is the violist of the moment, the Castellian String Quartet, who are in the hall, and the piano trio, the Gaspar trio, Jeremy Denk and Joshua Bell will also be part of that. So uh, do watch out for it. I think that's, that's going to be a very special series. Now, you mentioned the great, the great piano sequences that you've had here before. There are two other names we must talk about, Uchida's coming and Levitt's coming as well. Yes, Mitsuko Uchida hasn't given a recital, a solo recital here. She's been here in chamber music and in song, but she hasn't given a solo recital since 2001. And as a personal favor, she has agreed to give our 120th anniversary concert, which Fabulous. will be Schubert and uh, the second Viennese school. So I'm very grateful to her because she doesn't have to play in smaller halls. And it's, it's really wonderful that she's, she's going to do that. And uh, Igor Levitt is here a lot. We've loaned him to the Barbican for this season. And we're very magnanimous the, on the basis that he would come back 18 times next season. So he will do the Beethoven piano sonatas. Uh, next season twice. Fabulous. He will also be here uh, in the Shostakovich Quintet with the Hagen Quartet, oh. who happen to be 40 years old. And I asked him to do the uh, triadic memories of Feldman, which is an incredible 90-minute piece. 90 minutes, by the way, in Feldman's is, is short in, uh, by his usual standards. Um, it, it's a kind of unpredictable and directionless work, but it's bewitching. It's a bewitching experience to hear. And um, Igor said yes, but you know, he's totally crazy because it was on the basis that I would allow him play the Schubert B-flat sonata alongside it. So that's going to be quite an evening. So Igor, if you're watching, everybody knows about it now and um, I'm sure the hall will be full. There are so many things to look forward to. Um, this is going to be Beethoven, Beethoven, Beethoven and more Beethoven in the months ahead for everybody. And it is physically impossible to hear too much Beethoven. You can't have enough Beethoven. But how have, in terms of the programming ahead, how have you made sure that you've got lots of alternative things for people to hear well, as well? Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn is a huge Mendelssohn theme. Is a yeah. big, right. So we have the string quartets with the Elias Quartet, Mendelssohn songs paired with Liszt songs in, in a very special series, and Mendelssohn unaccompanied choral, sacred choral works alongside right. Brahms and Schumann with the Cardinals music. You wouldn't expect Andrew Carwood and the Cardinals music in that repertoire, so I was very grateful that they agreed to that. So that takes us a little bit out of, of Beethoven yes. territory, and of course we've made sure that there's lots of Britain and Brahms this season as well uh, to complement all that's, that's going on. I think Thomas Beecham it was who said, the English don't like music really, they just like the sound it makes. And in that respect only, I would say that I'm English, but I have to say, uh, hearing Mendelssohn 6 here uh, a few months ago was utterly, utterly bewitching. I had no idea quite how big it was. It could have been a very, very large symphony in terms of the, 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 the quantity of emotion and so forth. And that's why we keep coming, because we never know what we're going to hear next. Um, let me ask you about your approach to programming, John, because it's been described in all sorts of ways in the, in the popular prints, including by the Observer, as quietly subversive. What do you think they meant by that? Well, um, I'm one of those things, I suspect. Uh, <laughs> I think it means that we, we put the unexpected beside the traditional. Uh, we know what the audience, audience wants. Yes. Um, Count John McCormack, you know, I, I never stop being Irish. <laughs> Count John McCormack used to prepare a program uh, and he used to say that I give the people what they want, a little bit of what I want myself and a little bit of what's good for them. And, uh, I think that's, that's the best way to look at programming. I think, it, it's, I think you can be too clever sometimes as, a, as an artistic director. I like making themes, I like showing an intellectual arc, I like showing, you know, look how clever I am, but that's not what people always want. Um, and you've got to put your ego on side, because sometimes, a lot of the time, people just want a good night out. And hopefully we give you that a lot of the time. 
uh, as well as all those intellectual journeys and all those wonderful themes. Uh, and any artistic director, I think, who forgets that uh, would, be, would be displaced very quickly. John, I can't stop myself, I'm sorry. I have to do something political, and I have to therefore ask you about Brexit. I think the cleverest, subtlest, and probably the funniest hostile speech about Brexit I've ever heard was Sir Andras Schiff before he performed the, uh, the Bach sonatas. Very, very funny for those of you who are, were there at the time. But there is a kind of shiver of unease around the entire musical community. How much of a problem is Brexit going to cause for artists traveling across the channel, coming from Germany and Italy and Spain and France here and going in the other direction? What is your feeling about it? Uh, well, we don't know, uh, but we've got to make the best of it. we have resigned to it. We will make the best of it. Uh, I visit colleagues in Vienna, in Berlin, in Paris, although the French gave me food poisoning two weeks ago. I wasn't very happy about that. Um, and uh, we're talking to each other all the time. I think for a venue like this, it's probably going to be easier than for the touring orchestras uh, and for some of the opera houses, uh, but we'll wait and see. And the thing is that you know, music has no borders and it will bring us closer together, if anything. As a musical community, we're all looking out for each other. And certainly this hall is very much in, in Europeans' hearts and they haven't lost any of the affection. They were a little bit cross with us at the beginning of that three-year period. Time has moved on, and I think the affection for this hall is certainly there from the artists, and nobody is telling me I won't come to Wigmore Hall. Politics aside, is this the most European-feeling place in London, or indeed in the UK? Some evenings it feels that way. It probably is. It's got, it's got the whiff of old Vienna. And, and, and many other things besides. Uh, and uh, that's just wonderful that we have that wonderful European, Central European repertoire here, that treasure of music uh, for anybody who wants it. We're not going to convert the whole world to listen to our very uh, prestigious chamber music. I can, I can hold up the torch for it and all that sort of thing. Um, but we want to make it available to anybody who wants it. So as long as we keep the doors open, that's the most important thing. And in financial terms, that's your real message. Keep the doors open. With any luck, some extra doors at the side of the hall in due course and some bigger bar spaces and more food. That's always a good thing. Um, I'm going to finish by asking you one really, really nasty, unfair question. Of all the programming that you have prepared for the new season, what is the single evening that you are most looking forward to yourself? Uh, it, it changes every day. But there is, something, there is something that I think is very important. We, we just had Blue Monday, and uh, male suicide rates in this week, in the UK and in Ireland, in this week in January, over the past 10 days, reach a peak. And it's something people don't talk about. They don't talk about mental health. You're meant to have mm. stiff, up, so, stiff upper lip and all the rest. And a young singer approached me and said that he would like to cycle from Truro Cathedral on Blue Monday and end up at Wigmore Hall, and that several of his colleagues, all of whom have had some sort of blue moment, not necessarily suffering from extreme depression, but you know, life's yeah. ups and downs, and they will get together here and perform Winterizer at the end of that cycle. Oh. And I think there'll be a lot of national attention actually on that, and that they're prepared uh, to come out and to talk about this. So that's something I think is very important, and I'm looking forward to that very much indeed, because it's these sort of events asking Rabbi Julia Neuberger to come here later in the year to talk about anti-Semitism, that sort of thing. It doesn't always have to be a concert. It's the sort of things that we can do around that. Slightly political messages, but, mm. but very important. And to talk about health and well-being, we see performance anxiety backstage with artists all the time. Uh, we see people, members of the audience beginning to suffer from dementia, and we, we help out if we can. If they don't have a carer, we get a little bit involved with their regulars. All that, this is a family and we like to look out for each other. That's what part of what Wigmore Hall is about. Well, as somebody who's had some downs as well as ups, I can remember many, many years ago when I first stumbled into this hall, a little bit nervous, a little bit intimidated, not quite sure what I was going to get. One of the things that I didn't realize was how much I enjoyed Lieder and song. I didn't think I liked it. And it was the Winterizer that brought me in. And now every single winter requires a Winterizer. So I'm looking forward to that very, very much indeed. John Gahill, one of the greats of the artistic and musical world. Thanks very much indeed for talking to Thank us. Thank you, Andrew. Pleasure.
Thank you. 